All right, Living Temple, I just want to give you a quick update on sermon accessibility. As you know, we're not meeting on Sundays for at least a couple of weeks, probably more like a few months, judging by the news. So what we're going to do is after this, you'll see a sermon recorded by Jess. We're going to record the sermon, upload it to YouTube, Facebook, and also directly off our website. So we're not going to live stream. A lot of the other churches are live streaming, but I know what will happen if we plan to live stream it at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning with our track record with technology. It's not going to work. But the blessing with this is if we upload it, then it's up to you when you watch it, um, who you watch it with, um, how you watch it. So you can watch it online, you can listen to it on your headphones because we'll upload the podcast as well. What we really need you to do is gather together either in your life groups or with friends or online. Um, if you're not in life group, which is one of the questions we've got, we need you to actually reach out to some of your friends at church, text them, see what they're doing, and start forming little friendships and groups. We can't really facilitate that. So what we need you to do this week is to listen to the sermon sometime in your own time. One good thing about it not being Sunday morning at 9 o'clock is if you want to get it done early in the morning, you can. If you want to do it Friday night, you can. If you want to do it in a small group on the beach, you can, or by yourself, or just with your family. The options are endless. Um, so for the time being, this is how you're going to get teaching from us. Now, on a wider scale, when it comes to pastoral care, please, as I've said in previous videos, just step up your interaction with one another, step up your involvement with one another. If you need help, reach out to somebody. If you can give help, give help. And we're going to get through this together. It's an awesome opportunity to see God move every day. So God bless, enjoy Jess's sermon, and we'll see you in the next coming weeks. Hello, welcome to my house. I don't know where you're watching this from today. You could be at a friend's house, at home by yourself, or maybe on the beach somewhere with a crew that you love. But it's so good to have you with us. Through this time when we aren't gathering in large groups, it's so good to have technology make it available for us to still keep connecting. And with that, we're also going to be doing this sermon today slightly differently to what we normally do. Throughout the sermon, there's going to be times where you can pause me <laughs> and have a chance to have a chat by yourself. Now, if you're not watching this with someone else, you can call someone else up on the phone or maybe even journal some of the questions. The questions that we are going to be talking about are available in our life group discussion booklet. So they've been written out uh, for weeks in advance. We didn't actually realise this would be happening with coronavirus, but um, we are prepared for that now. So whether you're in groups of twos, threes, tens or on your own, it's so good to have you joining us online. So grab your cup of tea. I've got mine. And um, let's dig into this. You know, one of my favourite memes at the moment is whoever started playing Jumanji in 2020, please finish the game. <laughs> We've had so many different challenges as a nation even this year. We've had the fires, we've had drought, we've had the, the farmers really struggling with that. We've also had flooding and storms and now we have the coronavirus which is really taking its toll on, on people on who are actually getting sick, on travel, on businesses. And we're at a time when it really feels a lot like a pressure cooker. Now, this isn't unusual that we would see suffering in this life. If you're alive for more than five minutes, you know that this life isn't, isn't always easy. We all go through challenges. We all have hardships. It can be spiritual, it can be emotional, it can be physical. And it's so good for us to have the Word of God to help instruct us on what we need to do through these different seasons so that we can come out the other side of it and we can walk through it with the peace of God that he promises us. Now we've been um, going through Matthew at the moment and in our lead up to Easter and this week we're up to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prays. This is one of my favourite passages because um, through my own times of trial, even as a child and in my teenage years, I really resonated with this passage and it really gave me a lot of hope and a lot of encouragement because as it says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18, because he suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Now, it may not necessarily be that we're suffering because we're being tempted, but in our suffering, we have a saviour who has suffered. He knows suffering. 
He knows what it's like to be isolated. He knows what it's like to go through physical pain. He knows what it's like to anticipate hard times coming and he walks through it victorious. Now, while there's no scales of suffering, I mean, who's more valid to complain about their suffering than others? It can be quite difficult if you're going through a really hard time and you're trying to get counsel or encouragement from someone who really has absolutely no idea what you're talking about. You know, you say, I've lost my job and my family, I've broken all the bones in my body. And there's nothing really more patronising to hear back. Oh yeah, I hurt my finger last week, I totally understand. Let me encourage you and counsel you in this time. Now, once again, that doesn't mean there's more valid suffering than others, but how good is it that we have a God who knows what it's like to suffer, so that when we go to him for counsel and encouragement and correction, he's a God who knows what it's like and has the authority to speak into our situation. The God we serve is not an idea or an ideal. He's not some distant deity or power or force. He's a very real God who endured very real things and that he can connect with us in these very real times of hardship. So whether you're going through a time of hardship at the moment or someone else that you love is, this passage is a great encouragement to us. So let's turn to the passage. We last week looked at the Passover. We're in Matthew chapter 26. And we saw Jesus at the Passover. Just let his friends know, hey guys, I know what's coming up. I, I'm about to suffer. I'm about to die. And... They've reacted in different ways to this, but the biggest thing that, that he brings out is one, it's one of you who are going to betray me. Now, this idea of betrayal comes out so many times in this passage. Have a look through the chapter how many times it comes up. There's a physical level of Jesus' suffering, but there's an emotional level there too. He's not only going to go through some of the hardest things, but he's also going to be doing it being betrayed and abandoned. There's other levels on top of his suffering. And so for some of us, that might be something that we need to be hearing at the moment. So our question is, how does Jesus respond to the crisis and hardship that he's about to go through? But first, before we look at how Jesus does it, we'll look at our uh, life group and look at the first question which is how do you respond when you're feeling hurt, angry, lonely or tired? Have a think about that, discuss it with your group or journal it down, whatever which way you'd like to do it and we'll start on to the next. Okay, so we're on to our next little section. So we look at Matthew 26 verses 36 and onwards. You can read that in your Bible, whichever way, shape or form you like. Personally, I have my Bible app, which I love. I don't know if you had this when you were a kid, but I know I certainly did. You're out in public, you've done something you probably shouldn't have and your parents have caught you. And they say the words, just you wait till we get home. And there's not just the the suffering that will come at the time when you're disciplined. But there's also the suffering of the anticipation <laughs> that comes the whole car ride home as you're shaking in your boots, not knowing what exactly is going to happen for what you've just done way back there. Jesus is in a time when he's not only, you know, suffering knowing of the betrayal that has happened with Judas and is currently happening with Judas, but the suffering that he's about to endure. And how Jesus responds? He prays. Let's read verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. So Jesus is in this time of suffering, an anticipation of suffering, and he goes to the Father. So that leads us to our next question. How's your prayer life at the moment? 
discuss this with someone else in your group or even take some time to journal it. Okay, so we know that Jesus prayed, but how did he pray? Let's read. Firstly, he says to his friends, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. There's a couple of different things that we see here in this scenario. Firstly, Jesus puts around him community. He's going through hard times and he's going to the Father, but he's not doing it alone. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm going through a rough time, as a probably a more introverted person, I just close the doors around me and suffer in silence. And I really quite enjoy doing that as opposed to sharing it all around with everyone. You know, for the introverts, social isolation at the moment is probably more of a blessing than anything else. It's a real great excuse to be alone in your home. And, and as good as that is, as wonderful it is to be able to be fine with your own company, it's also important to be in a relationship with people. One that you have invested in enough that when you're going through difficult times, that you can call on your community and reach out to them. Let them know, I actually need some help here. And that's what Jesus does. So he, he asks for their help, but then at the same time, he doesn't rely on that for them to be praying for him and handballing that over. What we see Jesus do here, he's asking for their support, but then he comes in a posture of absolute surrender before his father, his dad. And he acknowledges first how he's feeling. He is human enough here. You know, we so often think of Jesus, you know, he's perfect, he's God, he must have found it so easy to walk to the cross. Or maybe we think, oh, the cross itself was really hard, but he was sorrowful. He knew what he was about to endure and he had a very human response to that. And that's okay. It's okay when we come to God. We should be coming to God when things are hard and going, God, if it was my choice, I actually don't want to do this. I actually don't enjoy doing this thing that you've called me to do right now. And Jesus acknowledges that what he's doing is far beyond anything, even anything we have been asked for by God. Because he talks about this cup that he has to drink. And, you know, you read through the Old Testament, it's, it's very symbolic, this cup of suffering. He knows he's not only about to endure the most painful death possible through crucifixion, but he's also going to go beyond a physical death. He's going to be in a time of separation where the wrath of God is poured out as he drinks upon him the sins of the world and takes that upon his shoulder. And that is what he's anticipating as being the worst part of what he is about to suffer and endure. How amazing is our God? You know, Jesus, we see him here and he knows what he's going to do. And the father knows what he's going to do. No good father would ever wish anything like this upon their child. And when you read this passage, don't think that the father's up there just being so happy and okay with this. It's not as though he is asking an easy thing of his son. You know, Jesus, if anything, is always saying how close he is to the father and his perfect obedience and his love for the father and the love the father has for him when they are one. They both know that this is going to be a terrible experience. And Jesus comes before his father and he says, you know, I don't, I don't want to do this. If there's any other way that this can happen, please let it happen. But then he, although he acknowledges and he asks for another way out, ultimately he does what we all need to do and he surrenders. This is not my will but yours because he knows that the will of the Father is good and perfect. And it may mean enduring hardship, but that hardship will bring freedom for the world. 
So our next question is, when you think of accounts of Jesus such as these, does his humanity surprise, encourage or confuse you? Okay, hopefully you guys got that question okay. Our next question we're going to go straight into, which is our fourth question. Is Jesus lived in perfect obedience, yet it was difficult for him to do so? Is being obedient to God difficult for you at the moment? That's a great question to ask one another and to really journal, because it also means, do you know what God's will for you in your life is at the moment? So we'll continue reading on. So Jesus has just had this heartfelt moment with God. And in verse chapter 40, we read after he's finished praying for the first time, he comes to the disciples and he finds them sleeping. <laughs> and he says to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again for the second time he went away and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And then after this second prayer, he goes once again back to the disciples. And again he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This kind of reminds me a little bit <laughs> of what it was like when I was pregnant with Josiah and they needed to induce me and they said okay have your dinner come to the hospital you'll spend the night in hospital and then the next day we'll, we'll properly induce you we'll put some gel on you to, to try and get your body ready for that the night before and then in the morning we'll, we'll really kick it into gear and you can have your baby the next day now, for anyone who's been pregnant or is thinking of being pregnant, you know that this is another one of those anticipation things. You really don't know how it's going to be being in labour. Unless you've been there, you really can't understand how it's going to feel, but you have going through your mind all the different scenarios of what it could look like. So Dave and I went out the night and we had a beautiful meal down at Cooley. It was awesome. And we went into the hospital and they put some gel on and they said, look, you're no way near going into labour. There's no way this baby's coming tonight. Have a great sleep and we'll see you in the morning. About 20 minutes later, I am in quite a bit of pain and I'm getting these, you know, stomach cramps that are, that are really quite hardcore. And I'm saying, Dave, Dave, <laughs> this doesn't feel right. This is... This is, this is pretty hardcore. I mean, if this is, the, this is not labour, then this is crazy. Like, you know, you don't know what's happening. First baby, you don't know what's going on. Like, okay, about an hour of that, and then we go, okay, we better go ask the midwives what's going on. So we go out there and they're like, oh, you know, sometimes people react to the gel. You know, you're not, you're, you're not going to labour because it's... it's that's not going to happen. You, you weren't even close. So, so just try and, and go and get some sleep. Now, I don't know what you guys are like, but I cannot sleep when I'm in pain. <laughs> but Dave, we've had a you know, late night the night before. We've just had a big meal. You know, we're, we're thinking all day that we're going to get this, this awesome sleep here at the hospital. And, and we're prepared for that. You know, we're, we're tired. And and so Dave's just like, you know, hon, just, just go to sleep. You know, they said, it's not labour, you're fine. So I'm like, okay, you go to sleep. Um, 
I'm just gonna walk around for a bit see how we go and lo and behold I was in labor <laughs> and it went quite quickly um, but poor Dave he he didn't know because of what we had been told he didn't realize that this would be true labor that I was in so he didn't know that he had to be ready and up and had he known he probably would have fully woken up rather than saying oh you know just just you know let me sleep for a bit and you know the disciples are here they've just had this big meal they've just it's been a bit awkward you know Jesus first prays they can you not keep watch with me for one hour so he's been praying for an hour they've just had a big meal they're feeling a bit sleepy and they probably don't realize time and time again we see they don't realize the extent of what Jesus is saying when he says I'm about to die I'm about to be murdered my life is about to be forfeit for the good of the world some of them may have you know picked up on little bits you know maybe this is a metaphor we don't really get what he's after here obviously he's going through something so they're there for him but they really let him down you know jesus who knows what's going on jesus who who is in this time of great suffering and he's in this time where he's anticipating even in greater suffering his mates are there trying to do the best they can but they're really letting him down and he says to them you know the spirit's willing i know you guys love me i know you really if it was up to you you know you would be out praying with me right now but your flesh it's weak you know you want to be awake and helping me but you can't one thing that we sometimes don't realize is that Jesus has gone through this as well. For many people, they'll be, you know, I was going through a difficult time and the church just wasn't there to support me in the way that I wanted. You know, the church let me down. You know, my Christian friends, they let me down. They dropped the ball. They should have been here in a certain way and it just didn't happen. Jesus responds to his friends, not in a way that condemns them, but a way that just acknowledges their frailty, their humanity. He knows that they are not perfect. And as a church, we have never claimed that we are perfect. We are going to let you down. Someone who is a Christian in your life is going to let you down. And even over this next season, you know, someone probably will let you down. And it's not because they're against you. It just might be that they don't understand what it is you're going through or how it is you're going through it or their flesh just may be weak. It's an encouragement for us as a church to try and be the best support that we can be for people who are suffering at the moment. You know, we have all people doing um, in all sorts of different scenarios at the moment that we know of. We know that, you know, Tom's cousin needs prayer. You know, he had a, a big accident the other week and he's had sustained multiple injuries. You know, Val is about to have heart surgery next week and she's going to need support and so is her family. Tess often has you know, difficulties with her health. And we love her so much. We want to support her as much as possible. But there are different people who are suffering in all sorts of different ways. There are people who have businesses who are, who are concerned of what this is going to look like, you know, when their customers are kept at home. We've got CYC with all their camps being pulled out because the schools are keeping away. We have people who work in the medical field who are coming into contact with people who are sick all the time. We have the vulnerable. We have people with special needs. There's all sorts of needs that are going on around us. So for, for you, no matter what your need may look like, make sure that you're reaching out to God and you're connecting with others. But also when others let you down, and if others let you down, please know that it's not because anyone is against you. We are for you, but our flesh is willing. And as a church, let us build up our capacity to love one another well. Let's encourage one another. Over this next season, I wanna ask each of us to particularly, you know, just pick two people in your world who you can really check up on and love and encourage and equip over this next season. It doesn't have to be face to face, it can be on a phone call. Just really try and be there as much as possible for others as you can. So our next question. Question number five, have you had your church support let you down? 
How should we respond when this happens? And lastly, maybe going to this straight away, how can we best support one another as a life group? Or whoever you're doing this with, ask those questions. How can you be a, the best support you possibly can be? Okay. Okay, hopefully you found that today's sermon slash devotional slash life group discussion has been helpful for you. Our prayer for this week is to pray that Living Temple will always be a place of genuine love and prayer support. Our challenge for this week is to decide how you're going to connect with God each day this week and ask someone in your group to keep you accountable for it. I really hope you guys have an amazing week connecting with God and one another. And may we lean on him in all things because he is a God who knows us, who loves us, who has the authority to speak into our lives, whether we be going through the highest of highs or the lowest of lows. Love you guys and we'll see you online and we'll continue to keep you updated with everything that's happening within the church and with the coronavirus updates and um, we will do our best to be equipping you. Please try and keep online as much as possible with these things and um, try and keep in touch with people who you know aren't online and try and resource them as much as possible, as best you can, um, in a way that they will be appreciative of. I hope you guys have a fantastic time together and I encourage you to worship now in whichever way your group um, worships, together, worships together. You can, you know... Put on a CD if you're old school or listen to something on iTunes or YouTube or if you've got someone who's musical, you can do that or maybe spend some time just in prayer and silence and praying for one another. It's up to you how you do that, but um, connect with God together now. Let's this, the word of God is, is active and alive and, and we want it to be touching not just our minds but our hearts as well. Have a fantastic week. Love you so much.